Welcome to An Afternoon with Lyle Jones. 26 years ago, I began working alongside esteemed actor, teacher and director, Lyle Jones. No influence has been greater than his in shaping my own teaching philosophy and my understanding of performance education. Lyle and I seemed different in so many ways when I first arrived at WAPA. I was the enthusiastic 29-year-old teacher whose electro music blared from the windows of my classrooms and Lyle was more classical in his way, a stickler for technique and tradition. So in the beginning, for the shortest amount of time, we each held each other with a slight dose of suspicion. This evaporated the moment we began sharing our belief in what power we believed the stage held for both actor and audience alike. Lyle and I loved talking about acting, theatre and teaching. We would dissect plays we had both seen and share tears remembering those rare magic moments on stage. Lyle is a born actor, a true man of the theatre, a scholarly and gifted artist, a tenacious taskmaster and a generously spirited man who never allowed himself to get in the way of the work at hand or in the way of any student actor's progress. Love the art in yourself and not yourself in the art. Truer words could not be spoken regarding Lyle Jones. In December 2014, I flew to Melbourne after Lyle generously agreed to speak to me about his life, his beliefs, and to relive times that gave him heart and hope in the profession he had served dutifully for over 60 years. I hope you enjoy our very informal afternoon chat in Lyle's home in St Kilda, City of Melbourne, Australia. How's it going? Yeah. Well, you do what you want to do. <laughs> so, well, here we are in 2015, yeah. Atlas Street, St Kilda, yeah. with Lyle Jones, so, having a chat about acting. Yeah. <laughs> the thing the same I was, old, same old. <laughs> so, the thing I loved to do when I first met you was in 1989, when I walked into the Melbourne auditions to get on the panel. And then that began our a sort of four-year uh, association at WAPA, and then sort of you know keeping in contact and a friendship since then. But I used to love talking about acting, and I loved your practicality and uh, productivity in terms of acting. In terms of if it's not simple and logical for an actor, they can't actually do it. Yeah. yeah. So what are the, what are the things that you find are the most important things an actor needs to know to be successful in the rehearsal or in their career? Well, I think the one thing that I could definitely very emphatically say about myself is that I'm totally text-based, absolutely text-based, uh, which is not to say that I don't see um, a place for improvisation in your general approach and, or even uh, as an entertainment, but i um, when I think of acting, I think of acting a text. I think that fidelity to the text is one of the first things I want them to grasp. I'm not saying that's what I first teach them. Uh, but that, the, that they are going to be interpretive. And the word creative was one that I think I banned for many years <laughs> around Whopper. Um, so that they realise that they're putting themselves into the service of the work. I think a grand phrase of Stanislavski's, uh, love the art in yourself, not yourself in the art. Uh, and, and then he said, for that leads to success in our work. What he meant by success is something else. But, uh, but, but I think that's where I really come from. Having said that, I don't know that that's going to make you much money. Uh, you know, and you could be marvellous at it and never make a cent. But that's, that's where I come from. Yeah, and there's that great quote that I always quote you on, which, uh, if I get this right, you say, you don't have to feel it in order to say it. You can feel it because you've said it. Oh, that's right. That, I think that's that, that, that little paradox is, is an answer to all that awful subjective uh, soul dredging. And that comes back to the basic idea uh, that I have of working on a role, do it, do it. Find out what the actions are. Now, that word action has got about nine different meanings. 
in our vocabularies. But the, uh, again, uh, to revert to old Stanislavski, shall I just read the book? Uh, <laughs> uh, is, you know, just do the physical actions, just do the action. You've got a vague idea of what you're supposed to be doing, you know, where you are, or just do the action. Uh, see what happens. See what happens. If you say it, you might, the feeling might come from it. Might not. But it's a good place to start from. It's a very good place to start from. Although I think as a, an actor myself, I work for the inside out a lot. Uh, I rather tend to push them a bit towards walking, working from the outside in. Um, I don't make rules about it or, or forbid them to do anything. Uh, but I think there is such a tendency towards subjective navel gazing uh, with regard to acting. And it all comes from the Americans. That's right. <laughs> There's a lot of things to blame. Here yes, as well. yes. Uh, uh, um, and the Stanislavski quote, of course, which I've always loved when I came across it. You know, the body feels, the soul responds. That's right. Once your muscles or your physicality itself... Well, that's the other thing, is the, the work that I love doing and, and do do a lot uh, when I'm running a course or, or working a course, is uh, they have to get themselves, themselves, their self, sensitised, absolutely sensitised, and that it's your body your mind yeah that's all you've got to work with that's all you have to work with it's not about you but that's all you've got to work with and you get that and, and that's got to be sensitized in a way uh that it's second nature like a dancer's legs what the dancer's legs do is second nature for them by the time they're really up and running or even up and dancing and that that is what the actor has to do sensitize himself and sensitize himself in a in a muscular way nothing to do with movement which i think is a very important aspect of the work but it's nothing to do with that it's what happens in your body viola spolin's work is a, is a really great sensitizer everybody wants to cry that if you, you know to be a great actor you have to be able to cry I've been doing that since I was three days old. It got me nowhere. Uh, but when you cry, when you cry, where does it affect you? I don't want to know what affected you in the first place, but where does it affect you? When you cry, is it in your nose? Is it in your eyes? It'll be all these things, but for each person it'll be slightly different. Their memory of being terribly distressed or slightly distressed think of it try and get your body to remember try and, and see you what you've got to learn to do is to be able to reproduce that in alliance with whatever is happening in the text and the scene and so forth uh, to be here and now in the moment at the moment of performance now that that has to be so well practiced that you can't think about it on the stage you can just do it. Like the dancer can go into an arabesque. She doesn't think about what her muscles are doing, unless she's got a sore muscle or something and has to consider that a bit. But otherwise, it happens. But it only happens because she's been done it, doing it for years and years and years, so that it becomes second nature. You see, what we all call natural, I'm not quite so sure about what that means. I think nearly everything we do is second nature. Mm -hmm not natural. There are two or three things like defecating and things like that that are natural, but the rest of it. And the minute you decide not to do that in public because people mightn't like it, it's second nature, isn't it? Mm, absolutely. So, and that's, that's what I think you're working on. And to, to stimulate their imagination at the beginning, I think that, and let that come from the text, there has got to be a moment fairly early on when the value of the text has to be respected. I think what happens a lot, again, <laughs> I think it stems from American. <laughs> uh, 
But we do it a lot. No, and and, and I, I, I certainly use it in classes, and I'm sure you do. We do scenes a lot, the big scenes from big plays. We train them on. The slight drawback to that is there's an awful lot of moments in play in a two-and-a-half-hour play that aren't the big moments, and you've got to be able to accommodate that as well, uh, but even possibly more. When I was working with Robert Benedetti in 1986, ah, yes, yes. Uh, he said a fantastic thing which I never forgot. He said to the actors, I want you this weekend to look at the scenes that you're in in the Shakespeare play, and I want you to imagine that you're the director and the producer, no yes. longer an actor, yes. and the budget just got cut, and they have to cut those scenes. Write down what the play and the audience miss out on if that scene was to go. Yes, I think that's terrific advice, and I shall use that the next time I go into a classroom. <laughs> Uh, yes. But it's so good looking at what does the audience what is going on in this scene that's right. and what do the audience need to get. That's not right. what can I that's do right. with it. That's right. You do everything you can and not the think of the audience. But in the preparation of the play I never think of anything else. Whether they can hear that, whether they'll see that, whether they'll get that point. Uh, I think actors they get so concerned and are encouraged to get so concerned with their own feeling and themselves in all the wrong way that they never think of it. And, and, and then some myth has grown up that if you feel it right, uh, it'll be right and it'll come out right. Well, it won't. It depends on you and you're different to me. And what you do easily in your life, uh, that is readily available to you on the stage. But it may not be available to me. I may, I may have a, a, a absolute, uh, totally other responses. And that's where you have to change yourself as an actor. You have to widen and widen and widen and not just understand, because that's only in your head, but be able to ab embrace all sorts of responses and make those your own. Make those your own. And that's why that great thing when you've directed the play and you go back to see it a week or two later uh, and then you see what the actors have done with it. Yeah. And sometimes you say, yes, that's clearer, that's sharper, I love that moment there. That extra pause there is terrific. But other times you say, no, yeah. what are you doing? Yeah. We had that moment consolidated. Yeah. That's right. It was clear and it worked and now you've extended it because... Yes. It, you felt it one night, and now it's not telling the same story. Yes, that's right, that's right. And, and the hardest thing for as an actor, and, and for them, is to realise that, and yet not to be thinking about the audience, so that, and, and, and so, so that you, you keep to the, the shape, to, to the form that, that you've worked for, uh, with and through. And you work through that every night, and of course then the big problem of acting is now how do you keep that fresh every night so that each performance is not just an imitation of the one before it. And that's, that's the tricky question uh, for theatre actors, and always will be. Not quite the same on the screen. I mean, the great thing about the screen, I suppose, especially now they're all televisions recorded and so forth, is you've only got to get it right once, you know. But when you're working in the theatre, you have to get it right every night. People are paid for tonight. There is a tendency to imitate what was good. And, and we think we're doing it again, uh, but we're not really. We're imitating it. And so there's a whole lot of techniques, as you know, as well as I do, uh, that again came through Stanislavski uh, and some of our American cousins. Of, of, of working through actions with intentions and objectives and things like that and those are the things that will keep the performance if they are if they are actually um, connected with every night they are the things that will keep the performance yeah uh, we talk about Hugh Jackman the thing that I've always been astonished by I haven't seen it for years but um, that was that he seemed to process it every night. He seemed to process it. wasn't hasn't been done and sort of copied. The outline is there and that stays, but it see the moment seems to be processed every night. Um, and the, the, I don't know whether you ever saw his. Uh, I didn't see it in uh, on the stage, but his Oklahoma. Um, there's a DVD of it now. I think. 
he did it for the BBC uh, and it was shown on a Sunday night here in Melbourne uh, but I think it's on DVD now uh, and every moment of it seems is absolutely new meeting absolutely new meeting so and your distinction I always use your words um, you know don't recreate the performance but re-inhabit the performance yeah, that's right that's right that's right I uh, don't uh, the other thing I often say is don't repeat it do it again and the doing it again is is where the meat of it all is real mm. it comes out of the, all that stuff we we do about objective what you want what the action is what you're trying to get in the scene from the point of view of the character but always the form that that is presented is in, is one that is totally clear to the audience uh, what people tend to forget about audiences I think is that we get to know a play let's say Hamlet or King Lear or something like that worth talking about we get to know it very well in rehearsal we discuss it we you know, turn it inside out we have theories about it but uh, the audience sees it once and they haven't seen it before I don't care what anyone says there might be about two people in the house that have seen it before even less that have probably read it and it must be clear now. If it's not clear now, it doesn't matter how profound or wise or anything else your interpretation is, if they don't get it now, they can't turn the page back, they can't stop, they've got to get it right this minute, clear cut and on to the next one. I'll say one way or another, acting's a bit of a, 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 bit of a bugger. <laughs> so... <laughs> Well, it's true. I mean, it has been the the decade of interpretation for me. And when I hear they're going to do the three sisters in an elevator, <laughs> set an elevator or something, or there's some, like there was a show I won't name where recently on, where the big the big catch cry was a Shakespeare. The big catch cry was, uh, this is going to be such a unique event because the audience are going to be sitting on the stage and the actors will be in the auditorium. And do you think, does Macbeth need to have that? Well, that, that's right. That's right. That's right. It, it's giving people are looking for things to just do the play. I get sick of people. I think Baz Luhrmann said this. Anyway, I don't mind abusing him because I don't know him at all. Uh, um, something about uh, when he did Romeo and Juliet, which actually, much to my surprise, right from the second in time, really quite liked. But Oh, people are so sick of this in Shakespeare. They, they, they don't want that and they, they want something different. They're not sick of anything in Shakespeare. Most of them don't go to Shakespeare. They haven't seen any Shakespeare. And most of the poor people who go into that audience have never looked at Shakespeare in their lives. So you don't have to jazz it up, you know, just do the play. And um, there is this attitude of, oh, we've got to be different. Why? Different of what? Different of something that was very good. It's quite easy to be very bad, I suppose. But, you know, it's uh, uh, this craze for originality. Uh, I don't consider myself original in any, in any way. Nearly everything I do say and believe in, I've picked up elsewhere. I've had about three original thoughts in my life, I think. That's where I come from. <laughs> <laughs> But it's so true when, when, you, when you think that people don't trust the material enough yes. for it to speak to us. I that's mean, right. And if it's good material, it will speak to us. That's right, that's right. I mean, a, a modern version of a Chekhov play, and everyone's running around with iPads and iPhones, going, Moscow, 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 we'll never get there. And you go, you're holding a $1,000 piece of technology in your hand. You could Google Maps Moscow... You could, you could YouTube, anything you want to YouTube. That's right. The world you're living in does not have That's right. three sisters That's longing right. to go to Moscow. That's right. Which is a bullet train in 12, sec 12 minutes down the track. That's right. That's right. So it doesn't make sense to me. That's so right. unless you honour the sensibilities and the etiquettes and the protocols of the guiding conditions of the time, it doesn't make sense that's to me. That's absolutely right. And I think that's... Um you know, they, they say it makes it relevant. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, when I see these sort of things, um, you know, three sisters with iPads and things like that, it doesn't make it more relevant. There's a total irrelevance going on, you know, between what they're saying 
which seems pretty mad considering the world they have set the play in. Mm. It's, um, it, it's, it's not, I do think, and I think this may have a lot to do with our tertiary education. Uh, I don't think a lot of people know how to read a play. Reading a play is quite difficult. Um, you know, you've got to hear it and see it. And you've got, ideally, to know something about theatre to get the fullest value of it. Shakespeare is different because it's, it's such a ma he was such a mammoth genius that you can get much just off the page. If you, although that gets harder and harder because it's further and further removed from us. The language is more and uh, less and less uh, immediately accessible to us. Um, but, but, but reading the play and, and knowing how it works and how a particular play works. Um, and, and, and playwriting certainly is changing. I mean, the plays that I was brought up on um, were all linear, plot-driven, character-driven. It's all pretty clear. If you, if you look for it, you can find it there. But techniques of playwriting are changing um, a, a lot, I think, uh, especially you know, as we speak. Uh, but you have to be able to see and hear what the something like what the writer has seen and heard. Uh, and then you've got to add up the whole thing and be able to decide what you think the overall statement is before you can break it down again and begin to put it into coherent bits that uh, ends up with whatever you think, that, and if it doesn't end up with what you think the, the vision is, then you've got it wrong, haven't you? <laughs> so. Well, that's the interesting thing I find at the moment, and I don't know what what your thoughts on it are, but I find myself less and less and less over the last number of years talking about objectives and talking about what is going on between these people. Oh, that's right, that's right, that's right. Because often I find the character has no idea what their objective is. Oh, the, the character certainly doesn't. Um, and certainly the idea of objectives is one you have to be careful with anyway uh, because there's a literary way of looking at that in your head which might be useful for the director, might not. Uh, but the character certainly doesn't know. Uh, where I work on objectives a lot is to... I don't worry too much about the super objective, even for the lead character, uh, but just sort of say, um, what do you want right now? What, what is your objective right now? To, to, to persuade him what you're saying is right, or to get him out of the bloody room or whatever, not something that you decide, you found that in the text. What he's trying to do is to get him to go, uh, and, 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 and so what you're saying and doing is all geared to that. That's your objective, work on that. But, but, the, but the major objective, I, I agree with you, that can really, people come onto the stage, uh, young actors will come onto the stage, and, and they're not, the choice that they have made maybe for the characters overall objective is not wrong but it's no use when you come in as a character dead tired throwing your bag down and gone to the kitchen to, uh, to fill the kettle for a cup of tea all you want is to a, a cup of tea to, and, and that's all you have to worry about in this scene that's all you have to worry about in that so that's right i mean if you look at the the overall objective of all the characters might simply be to survive it oh that's right well, that was, that's what old, um, what was his name? Um, Ilya, uh, uh, Ilya Kazan. Kazan. Uh, uh, he, he had the notion that, um, and he couldn't sort of make it work, that this, what he called the spine of the play, everybody was kind of linked to that in some way, and he would state that in a sentence. Or, uh, but I don't think, think that's wrong, but it didn't be much help to me. I just want to know what the character wants now when he comes. Why is he saying this? Why is he saying this really? Why is he doing this? What, what, what? And, and just play that. Just, just do that. So and that is action. That, that is action. Uh, or with a purpose behind it. That'll make this scene work. Let's forget about what tomorrow's scene is about. So, you know, I mean, if they 
what you're doing as far as saying for fixed rates that well you got rather than wrong but 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 let's not think about all these profound stuff about what she wants she wants a cup of tea then at that moment every night somehow or other the way you you not me the way you work when you you're wanting a cup of tea that's what you're using that's what you're using each night each night to carry a conviction to the audience mm. so and it's the director outside who's shaped it and said that'll have to be slower that'll have to be faster uh, that'll have to be louder uh, so clearer um, and you're living through all that you're living through all that it's terribly easy to talk about <laughs> I love that thing that um, Bob Benedetti said to the class when I was there. Uh, he said, you don't give energy, emotion or character to the scene. You get energy, emotion and character from the scene. From the scene, yeah. Yes, yes, yes. And there's something fantastic about that that, that can completely change an actor's education if they understand that I principle. I think that's true, you know. I think that's true. I mean, because it just comes to mind that I saw something the other day uh, and an actor was doing Hal from Henry the Fourth, part one or two, with Falstaff, and I know you all, uh, 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 speech. And he was being uh, coached through by a, a helpful actor, but it was all, he was imposing all the wrong energies on it. And he had an, uh, and, and what he was doing, he was doing quite well, but it didn't ring true because it didn't match the speech really. He was oppressing the speech. He wasn't intending to, but he was oppressed. Instead of asking himself, because the language was difficult and so forth, what is he doing? Why is he saying this? What's he doing here? And it was all very aggressive. Uh, and it's just not meant to be. And so the words and the language Shakespeare had used did not actually, he, he was able to impose that on those words, but th those words were meant to convey something else in the scene, which is that he is standing aside and looking at them all and making uh, rather brooding comments on, 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 on their relationship with him. Mm. Uh, and it's clear. I mean, there's no argument about that. That's what's happening. Uh, now, okay, uh, this is the famous, uh, you know, we'll do a speech from a play. And the actor is, what can I do with this? What can I do with this? And what the poor lad really needed to do was to probably read the whole play through, <laughs> you know, and find out where Hal sat with all this and, and what was going on at this moment to get it right. Well, life's short, I suppose. <laughs> you know. <laughs> but, um, well, it's like in an audition when um, I say to somebody, when you're doing your monologue and we've got somebody on stage, downstage left or downstage right, facing you, the moment my head starts to turn towards the person you're talking to, I know it's working. Yes, yes. Because the focus is no longer on you. I'm looking at the person you're trying to have an impact on. That's right. You're trying to change right. their will. That's, that's so true. The, uh, uh, the, so one of the questions I ask a lot, what do you want him to do? What do you want her to do? What are you trying to get her to do? Oh, well, I'm upset. I know you're upset. I'm saying that. But what do you want her to do? What are you trying to do? It's that, that, that's it. Uh, and it's not that they're selfish or stupid. It's something to do with the way we train them because a lot of the early training is very much on self. And it's, there, there's a, got to be a moment, although Vale Spolan uses lots of group situations too, so that you can't do the exercise without having someone else to do it with. And that's the feeling you've got to get, get uh, when you're performing. What, you know, the, I actually need this other person here. I actually need that. They're not, not something that sort of stands there like a stick while I do my bit, then they'll do theirs. And that brings you back again to the scene. Well, what do they both want? What are they doing? How are they working on one another? That's right. So, um, one of my wonderful friends, Tim McGarry, a Whopper yes, graduate, yes, yes. and he said to me, he was on stage once, I, I don't know whether it was at Whopper or shortly after, he said, and acting became very clear to me, he said, when I was standing on a stage and I realised there were three equal parts. There was the play itself yes, that was released yes. in the atmosphere, there was the other actor I was with, yes. and the two of us are intricately bound yeah. 
by the play. Yeah. Then there's the audience listening and we're doing it for them yeah, that's tonight. Right. That's right. And said so none of them are more important than the others. No, no. And all three work as a triumvirate. That's right. That's right. That's absolutely right. Uh, and to have respect for your audience. So, and don't... That it's a lovely thought that there's a kind of process of osmosis and, and, and maybe there is even a little bit of truth in this that if I've got it right and if I'm feeling it right, something intelligible will... Uh, communicate itself with the audience but if that's true it's intangible so don't rely on it you know don't rely on it let it work if it works but do everything you can in your preparation to make sure that they can get what they need to get uh, then you don't have to think about it again there's a quote that I remember you used to say but I can't remember the end of it you said, inspiration comes and goes, and adrenaline will get you through, but quickly fades with constant use. Uh -huh. yeah, possibly I did. <laughs> and there was a oh, last bit does, to yeah. I think you've tidied it up. <laughs> <laughs> I could have done so. Um, but I think the end of it then was something about technique or... Yes, I can't remember yeah. what it was. Um, I guess the point I was trying to make was that, uh, you know... It, really efficient techniques uh, and particularly physical uh, ones will uh, take you through moments where, you know. It probably came from something that Robert Lewis once said was, uh, <laughs> this is another old crude, uh, possibly more accurate way of putting it. Uh, somebody said to him, oh, what do you do when you've done all this work and you've done that? Uh, and, uh, and and you you come to the moment and you don't really have you don't really feel it. He said, "I fake it." <laughs> and how do you do that? It's it's because the technical work that you are capable of, the 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 external mechanics of the work, you you have aligned so much and so well with whatever the situation is that you can briefly just accomplish those, and it will carry the message. It will carry the message. It will possibly lack that little resonance, that little uh, element of truth, uh, but it will get you through. And you know, if you can't be good, well, let someone else be good. Don't get in the way of them. It's. Um, I think that's probably it's probably a, because it's true. Adrenaline. Uh, if if you have no technique, if you have no uh, method. Of present of performance, I like to artificially separate the concepts of acting and performance. They're not actually separate, but it's good to think of them as being separate sometimes. And your per performance skills, rather than technique, because it's a dirty word now for some reason or other, uh, your performance skills, if they are sound enough, and they will help you back into it again. If your performance has been properly prepared uh, and you've ha you have the skills available to you that you've already used, then at least going through the motions will keep a certain veracity in the scene until you get back on to, into kilter again, as it were. It's when you, work, you, you most see it is with amateurs who very often adrenaline and nerves and all those things, if it it demoralizes some completely but if, if some will take off on that but by the second third or fourth night that's all gone and if they have nothing else to fall back on then they're floundering uh, their performance is floundering and they don't know how to get back all those things they had on the first night which came from uh, not a good preparation but just from sheer sort of nervous terror. I do think that acting, I said this to somebody recently actually, something that I've always suspected and kind of tried to deny, but I do think a sense of danger helps an actor. You know, that's mm. uh, the, uh, Hugh Jackman, I think, once quoted me as saying that it, acting was like bungee jumping. Um, and I don't remember saying that, but I could. I could have said it, because I think it is. It's a, it's a, there's, a, there's a sense of danger, but not terror. 
terrible micro panic and terrible demoralizing but there's a it's just you know the whole building might collapse at any moment so let's just be a bit alert about all of this <laughs> i think that I, I do think that it's the theater acting the title of my last book the uh, the acting edge um was about that place that the audience and the actor must make a leap of faith from yes because this Tonight is a, is a history-making one-off. It will never be repeated. That's right. This audience, this cast, right. the play tonight in this that's cube right. of air that's will right. never happen again. That's right. That's absolutely right. And that's the excitement of it. So You don't know what's going to happen. So, so Gail Edwards used to say it's, it's like, it's like a, a high-wire act, really, yes, without yes. a net. That's um, right. And I, I mean, I always love that moment of standing in the blues in the wings and that moment that you feel the warmth of the lights on your face. So, and you completely go, go from one reality yes, to another. Yes. And it's a made-up one, but you know what you're doing. Oh, that's right. Because I always hated that, of course. I don't think I ever walked on stage ever in 60 years when I didn't feel quite sick for a certain second just before I stepped on. Oh, for sure. It went, it went quite quickly. But I don't think there was ever one night when I didn't feel you know, just just right in the pit of the stomach. Right. And that's why it's so important, you know, that when you walk onto that stage, you've got an objective. You're, you're going to do something uh, for a reason. And just do it. Forget the pain in your stomach. Do it. And then you're away. Well, that was the end of that quote, I think. It was about, it was about technique gives you a, an ability to, to re-inhabit you know, the play and to fulfill the action. That's right. And I, I know that uh, when, when I'm teaching technique, uh, or as you say, skill or craft, um, yeah, some craft. actors yeah, some actors feel that, oh, you're taking my spontaneity away, you're taking my sense of impulse away. Isn't that good? Yeah. My, <laughs> <laughs> my sense of instinct, or, and I'm going, well, as we all know, um, it will only be there to bolster and, and harness and yeah. focus your instinct. That's right. It's not going to replace it. That's right, that's right. Look, the, the, the actors drive me mad with those sort of things. I, I do a lot of, when I'm directing in the theatre, uh, I do very often uh, very precisely direct actors, like saying, if you're going to do that, turn your head on that word, not on that one. And it's been carefully chosen because it's going to point something that we're already doing when, when I say that. And they say... Oh, like, oh, no, 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 I can't do that. Oh, no, 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 you, you know, uh, let your eyes contact him on that word. Oh, no, 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 I say, if I was a film director and you were getting a thousand dollars a day for this and I told you to do that, you wouldn't dream of arguing with me. You wouldn't dream of arguing with me. That's right. And get on with it. Yeah. It's, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, that's true because, I mean, uh, uh, that great quote, a director is an ideal audience of one. That's right. Which I just love the fact that when I'm directing something, and I know that you'd be the same, you're, you're sitting out the front going, what do the 100 or 200 people sitting behind me yeah. for the season, which hasn't even started yet, what do I think they're going to need from this moment? That's right. That's, a, that's exact, exactly right. And if it means emphasising that word or getting eye contact on that word, that's right. somehow the director knows instinctively or, that's right. or just from it's history. It's going to work better. Yeah. It's going to work better. That's right. Of course you do. And, um, and that's the way you need to think. I think the trouble with directing for the theatre is that we get to know the play so well uh, that we take the wish for the deed very often while we're watching and we think the audience will get it, but they won't. They won't get it. They don't. They haven't done all the talking and thinking and examining uh, and, and arguing that we've done. Uh, and it is very easy to forget uh, that the audience needs something much that little bit more clearly than we need it now because we've seen it twenty times and we've already talked about this and we know what we think we're doing here. It's that. That's 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 where. The, the, the director's great um, obligation to the audience, that they know nothing. Assume they know nothing. Not even Hamlet. Not, not even to be or not to be. They know nothing. For, and make them know. Help them know. Yeah. So. I remember you talking about uh, tricks on stage, like 
backstage or on stage tricks for the cast to keep them entertained. Yes, yeah. You know, and how infuriated you would be yeah, if yeah. anything made it onto the stage, a closing night gag. Yes. Because the audience, and I remember you saying, and it really affected me, you said, there could be someone sitting in this audience watching theatre for the first time yeah. and they think that's what it is yeah. and they don't feel a part of it and they won't come back. Yes, that's right. I believe that. I believe that entirely. No, I was uh, very puritanical uh, about that sort of thing. Um, you know, it used to be a big tradition in England on the last night of a pantomime that everybody played up and played jokes on one another. And so, and some of the audience would come for that. I mean, those that were in the know or thought they were in the know might turn up for that. But I, I wouldn't have a bar of it, you know. And there were children in there. There were children there that had come, you know, on the last night that had maybe never seen a theatre before. No, 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 your responsibility is, is always to them, always to them. And I hated it, I absolutely hated it. But I tell you one thing, I might have told you this story before, but talking about technique uh, and the outward form of the performance, one of the most, oh, overwhelmingly impressive lessons of my life this is a story goes on forever, but um, was it when I first went to England, and I kind of knew what I was doing as an actor, and I was engaged for a revival of a very famous wartime farce. It was called Worm's Eye View, I think, and it was about this. What game was this? Oh, well, I just arrived in England, so it would be about sixty, right. maybe fifty nine, fifty nine. Uh, one of the first jobs I had there, the most of the audience would probably have known the play from its previous incarnation. The guy that played the lead in it, I think Rommel Shiner originally, was a guy called Raymond Dyer or Charles Dyer, depending on what mood he was in. Um, and he had played a long, long tour of it after it did its original West End. And he was probably in the original West End production. Uh, but not in the lead. So he knew it backwards. And it's all about the, these billeted airmen, and they're billeted in uh, the province or somewhere in a landlady's house who's a dragon, a real dragon, uh, and they're terrified of her. Uh, and they get up to all sorts of uh, sort of silly nonsense. But there was a scene in it, famous, which when I read I thought, well... They were easily amused if this amuses them. But it's... All the guys have come back from uh, the pub or whatever. They're all in Air Force uniform. Uh, and they're all billeted in this house. And they're terrified of the landlady. And they come into this room, which is upstairs, uh, on the first floor, I suppose. And it's kind of sitting room, drawing room thing. And the land... And there's a big table there and there are bits of furniture. And the landlady has made a jelly. Well, in wartime Britain, and all the audience at this time were well aware of this. I mean, that was like gold. So there's this jelly that is set on the middle of the table, and she's put it there to set properly. But she's not there. So they all come in. Somebody turns the light on, and it won't go on. They fiddle with that, and it is well established that the uh, electric switch is faulty. So the light goes on, and then the act goes on, and they all row and argue, and the, there's a young girl in it, the landlady's daughter, and she's in love with one of the men, and I can't remember anything about the play at all. But I had been cast as the leading man's offsider, his little Welsh offsider, um, probably because my name was Jones, I suppose. Uh, and, and so he and I were, were there mucking about and um, there comes a moment when there's uproar in the, in, in the room and everybody's saying shush shush uh, landlady will come the landlady will shush 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 and uh, there's a fight and all sorts of things happen and for some reason or other there's big curve there were big drapes up against the window 
on the right hand side of the the actor's right hand side of the stage, and these come down, the, they get pulled down, and so the window's got no curtains over it, and I would say, everybody says, oh, what are we going to do? What are you going to say? And then a voice comes from outside down in the street saying, put that bloody light out, and it's an ARP warning, which all the audience recognised, of course, uh, as that. Uh, so they all then rush to the switch and it won't turn off. So what are we going to do? What are we going to do? The landlady will be here in a minute. ARP warden is screaming out front. And then somebody says, we have to get the bulb out. So the long and the short of it was that we get to the table. Raymond Dyer, uh, this is all in the script, lifts me and I am to take the, light, the bulb out of the light. So he's standing on a chair, I think. I'm, he's lifting me up well over the table, which is where the bulb is, just over the table. I put my hand on it to take it out, go, ah! Push, push my way out of here and step straight into the jelly. <laughs> well, I didn't think this was very funny when I read it, but the audience, I mean, they'd be laughing anyway and we'll see it anyway. Well, I thought that the theatre was going to collapse. I really did. Uh, but this is the, part, the, the point of the story. I, I, he, he let me down, that's right. I, 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 I said, oh, oh and, 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 and pulled backwards, and he let me down straight into the jelly. And I was still looking at the light. The audience is in chaos. I mean, you could have sent off, set off a cannon, and they wouldn't have heard, have heard it. And Raymond Dyer said to me, hold your face there. I, I was astounded for a moment, but I did. And then he said, bring your eyes slowly down. Bring your head slowly down. And when I got it to a, a, a sort of straight level, and I was doing this just by numbers. I mean, I was sort of in the scene, but thinking, what the hell is he doing? Uh, you don't do these sort of things on the stage. But he said, bring your head and, and, and now stop there. Now, look down slowly, he said, and I look over. Every time I moved, the audience screamed for mercy. They, uh, then he said, now lift your head up again. Now, that's far enough, just stand there. Uh, they, it was a riot, all done by numbers. Yeah. It was all done by numbers. And uh, certainly I learned it that night, whereas uh, we couldn't have done that in rehearsal in a thousand but he he toured it for years and ju just knew it but he kept that all to himself uh, and he must have known that audience was going to make that much noise that he could do that without them knowing i mean he was bellowing that do this do this do that do that and each time i moved the audience shrieked and fell. there was no acting really going on at all there was later on I didn't put too much in, actually. <laughs> but, the, you know, that's, I don't know, we, we were talking about techniques and, uh, you, you know, the craft. Now, the, 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 without, I could have felt all that a thousand times, but if it hadn't been expressed in that way, it would have been useless to the audience. That's right. It would have been inaccessible to them. That's right. And what I had to do in the next performances was make sure that those things were in form. I suppose the absolute astonishment of what he was talking saying to me worked on the first time he did it. You know? I was just, I thought, I've never been directed on stage like that. But he was wonderful. I mean, I was terribly grateful to him. I never forgot it. I never forgot it. I learned so much that night. Just where your head is, what your face does, just when, at what moment. It's called, of course, timing. It's called timing. And I think when it's all boiled down, separating the, the, the sheep from the goats is that in, in the timing. And I do know, I remember reading somewhere that Edith Evans, old Edith Evans, said, uh, oh, oh, yes, I sort of tolerate directors. And, uh, oh, yes, I listen to what they have to say. The one thing I won't let them do is give me my timing. And if you've got it, if you've got it, it's a, uh, uh, but, but in the end, in the very, very end, it's the timing that really separates it, the, the good from the, you know, absolutely near perfect.
the quote I use for studying acting with the actors is, um, for me, the craft is the ability to inhabit and release recognisable human behaviour. That's right. To the that's audience right. go, I that's get right. that. I that's see right. that. That's and right. what you're describing in that moment there, for the person who stepped into jelly, the last thing they want to do is acknowledge or admit they've stepped into jelly. Yes, that's right. So the longer they can live in a fantasy world that they didn't do it, yes. or it hasn't actually occurred, yes. 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 the more excruciatingly delicious it is for yes. the audience. Yes, that's right. You see, I would have had that moment over... It. I mean, it would have got a laugh the moment the foot went into the jelly, uh, and, and what I'd rehearsed, and I would have had that moment over in 10, 15 seconds after, after the foot went in. I'd have been off the table and down. That's what we'd rehearse. But <laughs> Ray put this whole other act in. <laughs> and it worked. It worked beautifully. And of course, you couldn't then go through the mechanics and, and you know, because what each one is saying, you can tell what each one is saying to the audience. So, but yeah. I, I did learn an awful lot that night. So. And I think the timing, fantastic. And the other thing that people talk about is business on stage. Yes. I never sort of. I never connect with that word. Like the word blocking, I yes. I never think of it as blocking. I think of it as physical life. Yes, yeah. Blocking yes. sounds like something I'm being forced to do. Yeah, it's about uh, rather than something I'm actually living and doing. Yes, yes. But um, I remember seeing at the Royal Shakespeare Company at Stratford uh, Hamlet. Roger Rees was playing Hamlet. Oh yes. And Brian Blessed was playing, I think, Claudius. Claudius, oh, yes. Uh, with that big booming, fantastic yes, voice. Yes, yes. And. It was after Hamlet had inadvertently killed Polonius and he was on stage and they had a, a big silver bowl full of water and he was kneeling in front of it and he had his hands in it. And I think there's some dialogue from Hamlet and he's putting the water on his face. Well, in comes Claudius with about five or six guards either side. Oh, yes, yes. And it's a scene where he comes in and says, uh, now Hamlet, where is Polonius? Yes. So he says that. He says, now Hamlet, where is Polonius? And as Hamlet's about to speak, he puts his foot on the back of his neck and pushes his whole head under oh, water okay. and stands there. Okay. And suddenly Hamlet's arms are flapping around on stage and water's going. And you can hear him screaming inside yeah. the water. Then he takes his foot off. And yeah. then as he says that he's where the worms are, but yeah. not, not, yeah. not eating, but yeah. being eaten, yeah. Ryan Blessed puts his foot back on Hamlet's oh. neck. And then says some other line he asks him about Polonius. And of course, why I found it so fascinating was you saw the killer in Claudius. Yes, yes, yes. And the best thing was the six guards saw the fact that he was lethal. Yes, yes. And he was almost killing his, his yes, yes. son. Yeah, yeah. Stepson. Yes, yes, yes. And I love that. Now, that's not a gimmick to me. That is something that that's the director or yes. someone has gone... What if there was a bowl of water? What if Hamlet was washing his face, getting the blood out? Yes. yes. And what if Claudius did that? You know. Yes. Yes. And if, of yes. course, if it works for the text. Yes. 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 I'm, I'm just a bit caught up with that damn line that's missing. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes. What I do find missing a lot in drama schools is, and uh, where it gets tends to get a bit more American again, I think. This is true of America in the way they train their actors. Actors in America do a lot of classes. A lot of drama schools in Australia present a lot of classes. Some, maybe most, maybe all. Really quite good classes. But it's not the course. It's not a course. And I think an actor needs a course and what you've got to do is work out what he needs in what order. That, and, and that will be bitty enough because he'll be doing the physical techniques, voice in one room, movement in another. These have got to come together. Uh, text analysis, if, they, if they're doing that. But they won't, they won't be coming together in the maybe, say, the, the first couple of terms the brighter students will start to make connections themselves. But the course has to be sorted out so that it can eventually, with help from good instructors, then begin to take an overall form. What tends to happen in America, I think, is the actors go from school to school, uh, from studio to studio, they do courses. 
some drama schools do that, they do, they have good movement, etc. But nobody's turned it into a course. And so what, what the students are left with in the end is a lot of skills, but it's still not being put into the service of anything. It's like you give somebody a whole lot of jigsaw pieces, but no picture. And that's what worried it's it's uh, since I've left I was always aware of this but since I've left uh, since I left WAPA I thought more and more that really the most important thing is that the course is worked out so that it is easy for the students eventually to meld it all together and to use each skill as it is required just automatically just automatically because they've got the skill, because they've done it in class, and they've done it over and over again. Mm -hmm. uh, so they're not thinking about that when you're on the stage. It's there for you. And if you've got a weakness vocally, physically, or so forth, you work on that in your own time, but you can't stand on the stage thinking about it. Mm -hmm. So I think that's, that, that's um, and I'm not sure that a lot of drama schools work, work through the, the course, as it were. First year, they must do this. Before they do this, possibly, they must do that. It's never as clear-cut as that. It can never be as clear-cut as that. But you can begin to shape it a bit, I think. Yeah, uh, that's a huge distinction, I think, between a, like a conservatory or a series of classes that it, sort of may connect yeah. to, to a course that absolutely is designed. Where I remember something you said at, at WAPA when I was there, never teach an actor something they don't need to know yet. Uh, that's right, that's right. That's Which right. is so perfect. And it's hard, actually, it's hard. But yeah. yes, yes. I remember coming to you at WAPA, uh, I made some connections with, I think, the Philippe Jean T Company, and they wanted to come and do a series of classes, and I think you said no. Um, and the reason you said no, which I've always I understood at that moment forward, is what's the point of diverting from the course to allow some fantastically skilled people to come in and impart skills with, to the actors who don't need to know them now. Yes, yes, and, and it's, probably can't cope. Yes, it, yes, and it's going to get in the way of that arc of development that's right, that the course right, has. That's right, that's right. You see, that, that, that comes down a lot to what we were talking about earlier too, the creativity, that people want to do something new, something creative. I want a course that I can tinker with and make better perhaps, but I, I, I think you start off by saying, this is for good or evil what I think an actor basically must have to be viable as a, you know, not a, just a star. The one thing I always said about any school I had anything to do with is uh, we don't set out to make stars. We set, set, set out to produce actors. If they become a star, that's nice. But that's not what we've set out for. Uh, set out to do. It is to produce viable, employable actors, and that is the first thing you're thinking about. That uh, that they've got a basis. It's uh, you know the rest of it can come once they've got all their equipment and they're functioning. The rest of it, then they'll spend the rest of their lives uh, refining and and polishing up on. Mm. So. Which is why you can't sort of, you wouldn't dare in a course that was designed take a production in third year and bring it into first year. No. Or take a production in second year and do it at the beginning of first year. Yeah. Like you couldn't change the pieces no. around because no. it would make no sense in the overall picture. That's, that's right. That's right. That's right. One of the things that I have come more and more to the conclusion about is the importance of breathing. I always used to say that and I always believed it. But I've come to see, as I watch performances and all that, I just keep, I keep wanting to scream out to actors sometimes, breathe, breathe, yeah. breathe. It's not that you can't hear them, it's not that you can't understand them, but they hold their breath. They hold their breath and they don't connect with themselves. Uh, and it's all tied up with yoga. That's a, um, I suppose, it's certainly, uh, I'm, I'm all for yoga now, as long as I don't have to do it. Uh, but, um, but, but breathing down, you see, my generation, with our loud voices, we were trained to breathe all right, but most of the emphasis went on the ribs, and that is frightfully important, especially in the theatre, frightfully important. Uh, 
But we didn't think about the diaphragm so much. But it's that diaphragmatic breathing that actually centers you. Mm. And actors need to breathe more than they do. It's not you can't hear them, it's not you can't understand them, it's just you don't care because they don't seem to be connected. And I discovered that at Whopper. I used to go into other people's rehearsals uh, as the head of the department. I would find myself in second year rehearsals yelling out in other, uh, other directors, <laughs> breathe, breathe, breathe. Because I would sit and look at them and I'd think, are they good? I mean, you know, they look well. Yeah. It's intelligent. I understand it. Uh, I know what they're saying. I can hear it. Uh, but I somehow don't. And, 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 and it's right. You know, they're angry or they're crying or they're happy or they're whatever. But I don't care. And they, because they had been taught a breathing capacity a lot in the first year, which they need to do, they were still doing far too much on one breath. Mm. And they were not breathing with the thought. Mm. And I, I, I did spend a lot of my last years there. And now, if I get anywhere near an actor on coaching and so forth, making them breathe much more than they think they need to. It's only a teaspoonful sometimes. But it's absolutely necessary. Absolutely. That you take the smallest. I don't want to see you breathing. I don't want to know you're breathing, but, you know, if you're going to say what? Oh, yes, there must be a breath before the, oh, yes. You can say what? Oh, yes, but it sounds different. Yeah. It sounds different. I remember going into one of your rooms the first time I, I, uh, I thought I'd go and see Lyle directing and see how you would direct. Uh, and so I snuck into the back of the rehearsal room and I only stayed for five minutes, but all I heard you say was, and breathe, and breathe. Oh, uh, well, yes. And then I saw the difference. Yes, yes. Because we don't run out of breath in life. You see, the other thing that happens to us as actors is we're so busy trying to remember the lines that we want to get them out. So we don't, we, we've lost actually, if, if you ask us what we're thinking, we can tell you, but we're not. We've lost the thought because we've just possibly put the book down uh, I always say now, oh, the first rehearsal with the books down, I wish I had the courage not to turn up and leave it to the stage manager. Because, you know, until they have convinced themselves, they know what they, that they know it, that, that it's going to be a waste of time. Mm. This rehearsal is going to be them telling themselves that they know it. Now, then we can get back onto it again. It's, uh, and that, and, and that's, that's another reason. I thought I do, um, I'm sure I did this as an actor myself. When I watched them, I used to think, yes, I think, because I had terrific uh, breath capacity. Mm. And you ju just wait, hold the breath, wait, and boom out the next line. Mm. Tyrone Guthrie, nobody knows who Guthrie is now, but he was a great director of Grantees. He, I first came across it in his book on acting. Now, it wasn't the greatest book on acting ever written, but he said... And I've always remembered the phrase. And as soon as I read it, I thought, that's right. And I know that that's what I do when I'm acting. Although I don't know that that's what I, that, 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 that's what I do when I'm acting. He said, the deeper the, the, the feeling, the deeper the breathing, irrespective of the uh, amount of breath that is required for speech. Mm. The deeper the feeling, the deeper the breathing. Uh, and then I've elaborated on that. Who, with the new thought, there is, you, you must never run out of breath as an actor. You must never need the breath, uh, except that you need it to express, not because you're running out of breath. Uh, and it, it, God, it makes a difference. I still find by saying, breathe, 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 to people that it makes a difference. Well, I know when I'm uh, working on someone's audition piece, they... Uh they get up on the floor, they say what they're going to do, I say fine, and then I see them take this enormous breath. And I go, why have you taken such a big breath? And I go, it's such a long speech. Yes. And then you go, okay, so now we're already in a land which is distorting what needs to yes, take place. that's right, that's right. Um, and so if you can just take enough breath to say to be or not to be, yes, and yes. then take enough to go on with that. That's right. 
and then go on with that. That's then... right, that's right. Well, the thing I say now about speeches, and uh, I wish I'd worked this out a bit earlier, uh, is uh, they're not speeches. Um, it's a series of speeches. It is to be or not to be. That is the question. You thought. He didn't know he was going to say the, the second line when he started the first line. Mm. And, and, and so on all the way through. And it's only if a speech is a speech um, that somebody has made up as a speech that it's got that sort of automatic quality. Because it's, been, it's, it's one of the most interesting things about speeches and not uh, just long speeches either, is that I often say yes, but you knew you were going, you, the way you say that, you've got it all sorted out in your mind before you, before you started it. And you really go, ought to be finding it as you're speaking it. Yeah. And it's a slight, again, a slightly different, a slightly different tone, a slightly different rhythm. So, because uh, you don't know at the end, you, you, you d didn't know you were going to say that last line when you said the first line. That's that, right. That was not in your head. That's right. So. I love seeing um, Teatro de Complicite came to Sydney to do The Winter's Tale and Simon Bernie, so I, I think the artistic director was playing Leontes yes. and this wonderful woman playing Hermione. Ah. And, yes. and when, when she said, Sir, spare your threats, yes. Yes. the bug which you would frighten me with, I seek. Yes. He just took four steps towards her and looked at her as much to say, if you go on, I will cut your head off myself. Yes, yes. And that gave her impetus to go on and say, I love you. Yes. And, and then he walked away and then she pursued him. And it was a scene. Yes, yes, that's right. That's right. That's right. And I tell the actor, it's, it, it, it's only called a speech because the scene... One, one character doesn't know the other character to speak. Yes, back. <laughs> that, that's right. That's right. And, and, and you see, this is the material we teach with, and I don't know any other way of doing it. What are the top three attributes you feel an actor needs to have working for them in a rehearsal room for you as a director? A certain flexibility. I want them to have a good basic mastery of, of, of craft like movement and things like that i don't want any great specialities or that but i need to feel that they're they're kind of seasoned for the stage and i guess a certain confidence not not the wrong sort of confidence but a certain confidence so that they're not neurotically insecure so i can't be bothered with with all that you know any, any actor every actor will want help and comforting at some time but i can't be bothered now with the sort of actor that needs a lot of molly coddling so it uh, just doesn't interest me enough so and i've never been into psychology to, to that extent anyway so you know well that's the interesting thing we we're talking about before about the uh Emotional memory, emotional recall, emotional substitution. Yeah. You know, replacing the person on stage you're talking to with somebody else uh, that you've had in your past, uh, using your own pain or trauma yeah. in order to motivate on stage or on screen action. Yeah. I've never got my mind around that. And the way I talk to, it, to the actors about that now is that I, I do believe that human beings instinctively understand the universal issues. Yes. Yeah. Um, forgiveness, redemption, betrayal, yes. allegiance. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Love, a betrayal, whatever you yes. call it. Yes. Um, and I often talk about, um, you know, you might go to a, a large uh, rock concert or something, um, and the the band might play some song about unrequited love, some torch song. Uh, everyone's on their feet with their lighters in their air. Yeah. And if you went around the audience of the fifty five thousand people, how many people in that audience have never? experienced unrequited love yes have no history of it no experience yes. of it whatsoever yes. Yes. but somehow understand loss yes they felt that as a child they couldn't yeah. they of couldn't, course of course they, that's the important thing that's all you have to say to an actor is blocked uh you know have you not experienced anything like this so you know, uh, if you must as you were saying earlier well when your dog got run over you experienced that we don't need to go any further you see you know what it's like then you know what it's like. Now that's that's what you. Where, where did you feel it? How did you feel it? But that's that's what you need to use here. That's 
It's just uh, when they're pushing for an ocean rather than... Then somebody said... Oh, I can't remember the three things now. The three things that an actor needs to, to think about is what is the... I've, taken, I've pinched this from someone. What is the dramatic purpose of this moment, scene, whatever? What is the action from the point of view of the character in this scene? What are they doing? What is it like? Anything from your own experience. What is that like? Uh, that, that's where you'll get the, the, the real uh, genuine response from. The what is it like? question but you don't have to go uh, you know start to think about uh, well I mean my father at the age of three never lays eyes on him so you know I've got a problem if I have to start worrying about things like that um, he was out most of the time working I suppose uh, but uh, you know and I, I doubt if there's there may be occasionally some monumental moment in a play where you have to look back at some monumental moment in your life if you've had one I mean I haven't had a lot of monumental moments in my life uh, and, and, and consider it for maybe seven and a half minutes you know quite deeply and then, then it should be there for you it's, uh, and, and, but I do believe with Robert Lewis says I think or um, you don't bring that moment onto the stage you do not bring that moment onto the stage. So, you, you and, and you rehearse, that's why you rehearse. It comes, it comes, if you're doing the action, it comes organically. Yeah. So. It's like um, Laurence Olivier's very famous Richard III when yeah. he, he fell off his horse and he says, you know, my kingdom for a horse. Yeah. Um, he said that he thought about a fox being caught at night time in a trap. Yes, yes. And the fox was was moving through the forest or the bush, whatever, and his front two paws got trapped. Oh, and yeah. he knew, and he was in excruciating pain yeah. and knew that he would be then killed by whoever would find him yeah. or unless ripped apart by another animal yes, during yes. the night. And he said it was that sound of the snapping jaws of the bear trap Yes. that he used when he fell off the horse. Yes, yes. He said, but then the audience began to come for the sound of the scream. Yeah, yeah. He yes. said, I had to recreate it every night. Yes, yes. But there's a great example, I guess, of just making an imaginative leap. Yes, yes. What would, it, what would it be like if it was like that? Yeah, the imagination, of course, is something we don't talk about a lot, mm. actually. In the, and um, I think my generation, my generation is more aligned to text they were more um, prone to use their imagination simply because of the period. There was no television. We might have got the movies once a week if our parents were either sick of us or overindulgent. Uh, we listened to radio. We used our imagination a lot with that. We got used to words because we listened to radio. And the other thing we did uh, to amuse ourselves because there was no television and, and no toys, uh, you know. But the, I mean, half of my time, although I don't remember any of this, but uh, I, I was a depression baby. I don't remember I actually ever wanting anything, but I didn't have a lot of stimulus and toys and things around me. Uh, and then the war came, and so it, it, it wasn't proper to want things like that. Uh, so, well, yeah, the other thing we did was we read. We didn't read because we were clever. We were clever enough to read, but we didn't read to, or because we were studious or any of those. We read to entertain ourselves. And so we're very, very word-oriented, very, very uh, literal, uh, literature-oriented. And that stimulated the imagination a lot. Um, I don't know with the younger generations, the kind of visual generations, whether they are quite as imaginative in that way. I just don't know. I don't, I don't, I don't say they're not. Um, but we saw and we listened and we, we heard and, and we inhabited uh, 
you know, words that built up a picture called Treasure Island, Tom Sawyer. I, I read that once. I must have read it about nine times. And now they, they do, uh, it, 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 all those things are passive, I suppose, radio listening and reading. But you do have to make some effort to read. You do have to make, I still prefer reading to anything. Mm. I still prefer reading to anything. And you had to make some effort even to listen to a radio uh, play. But you can be very passive watching the television. And I very often am sitting right there in that armchair. And I think I can't even be bothered lifting the m m hand to get the remote, just let it go on. <laughs> so. It's interesting, you know, I, um, I was talking to some students uh, a couple of months ago about uh, the difference between, well, they were asking me about television acting and, and theatre acting. And I said, have you seen the size of your TV lately in your lounge room? Yes. So we've gone from the old square box. Yes, yes. We now have a screen size that you can have background and foreground people yes. and relationships, yes. which you can do on stage. Yes, yes. But you can't in a square, yes. the old square TVs. I said, and when you look at the series that people are watching now, from True Blood to Breaking Bad to Game of Thrones, I said, that acting could be done on stage. Yes, yes, yes. Vocally yes. and physically. Yes, yes, so yes. So it's just a matter of what the camera <laughs> yes. require, what the audience require through the camera of that's you. That's right, that's right. And what it could, it could do. I did, uh, I think I told you I did the first one ever done in Australia. I was in the first um, ABC thing ever sent out, but it was live. Terrifying. Mm. We were terrified. Um, God knows why, because about four people had a television set. <laughs> but but um, it was the Duke in Darkness. I don't remember anything about it except just getting the, the you know, getting the words out. <laughs> so, it is it is different, and most of them are going to work in studios. You know, most of them are going to work in studios. But I wish they'd give a little bit more thought to their words to what what is 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 behind what they're saying. I mean, there's great talk about the subtext and what they're not really saying. Yeah, fine, I'm all for that, but also let's have a go at what, we're, what we are really saying. You know, what, 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 what am I saying and why am I saying it? It might have a subtext or not. I think Shaw always, I was always very impressed. He said, Shakespeare, you don't um, act uh, under the line, around the line, over the line, but on the line. And in that sense, there is no Shakespeare, there is no subtext in Shakespeare. Uh, that character might be being devious and hiding things, but he'll tell you so before he starts. Uh, you know, that's why Iago is one of the wonderful way of playing Iago is just to be absolute, as if it's absolutely dead honest, and and it works perfectly. And you don't have to convey any subtext because you just said to the audience, watch this. See what I'm gonna do. That's right. That's right. That's right. It really annoys me on stage uh, or on screen where where the audience know the person is lying. Yes. But you can tell they're lying. So if you can tell they're lying, why couldn't the person That's they're right. telling tell? I they're always lying? say, as you say about Iago, I never understand why he doesn't ring the police. You can tell this guy, you know, is is, is a, from a word go. You, you have to be deaf, dumb, and blind as well as black. <laughs> so to, uh, to, 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 to let him get away with it. It was always great at Whopper when uh, you'd be in a short piece at lunchtime or yes, join the play or something. And it, I think it meant a lot to the, to the students to see someone who was the, the head of the theatre course, uh, someone of your sort of you know, history and stature that was willing to walk on the high wire. I, still. I, do, I, I did do a couple of things there, didn't I? I remember doing one with Tommy Weaver, a little one of the, Tommy Weaver. What was that? That was um, that was the, the the father taking his son to a brothel. Uh, that that was great fun. I loved doing that. So yeah, and uh, and I did some scenes from School for Scandal for them too. I think after I played it, but uh, and I think you and myself and John Milson were all in a musical theatre piece. Dance piece that Alan and, Alden and somebody yeah. mentioned that to me only the other day. Everybody ought to have a mate. But that, that that that's right. And I think Jeff Gibbs was in it, wasn't he? 
didn't know the words. Uh, <laughs> um, now, who was it? Somebody said to me the other day, I always remember you, and I'd forgotten it. And she said, uh, I always remember you and, 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 and those other people doing <laughs> everybody ought to have a fight. And all I could pick up was, yes, and Jeff Gibbons didn't know the words. <laughs> It was very frightening standing in the wings seeing what we're all dressed in. I remember that. I can't remember. Oh. It's like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear, oh, dear, oh, dear. All right, well, the, I think we're about to run out of tape, but the great Sydney audition for WAPA and one of the second years didn't turn up to be listening to the pieces from oh, the people yeah. auditioning. They asked whether they could use somebody and you said get Jeff from the foyer. <laughs> and so Jeff came in in his suit from the foyer and stood there downstage left and this little, quite a short girl said, I'm doing a piece from blah, 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 which you and I didn't know what it was from. And then she suddenly turned her back and then she started and she was like some vixen. She went crazy and screamed and then she ran up and slapped Jeff right across <laughs> the face. And she fit, and Jeff took one look to us and went, oh, like, <laughs> and then went back to the scene. Yeah. And then after she finished, she said... <laughs> Just before you leave, I'd love to go back <laughs> to that moment. Oh, did I? <laughs> so Jeff got another serve across the face. <laughs> I faintly, faintly remember this. <laughs> Jeff never forgave you for it. Uh, I, I faintly, did she get in? <laughs> did she? I wonder who it was. Maybe she didn't come. <laughs> I always remember the guy that said, who asks me this? Who, who plucks my beard and breaks my pate across? <laughs> and that is the most hideous moment I think I ever had in auditioning. I was, it was so hard not to laugh. It was so hard not to laugh. I remember freezing beside you and thinking if he moves, I'll kill him because I'll laugh. That <laughs> breaks my pate <laughs> I've never forgotten that. I can see myself staring at a white piece of paper thinking, think of heaven, think of who think of anything. <laughs> I mean, didn't have to listen to him, I thought he'd never get in. So. <laughs> Oh, that, that's the one I most remember. And there was that, there was a, a I'm sure I was with you when this happened, a, a, a very tall, good looking, sort of strapping uh, boy was there, you know, I thought very strong, great voice as well. And um, I, I said to him, what are you doing for your contemporary piece? And he said, a, 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 a selection from Die Hard 4, the film. And then he said two or three lines and that was, that was his contemporary piece, four lines from a film. Anyway, then we got to the classic piece and I said to him, what are you doing for your classic piece? And he said, a scene from Rambo 5. <laughs> and I said, for your classic piece. <laughs> and he said to me, mate, it is an absolute classic. <laughs> no, I don't remember that. <laughs> I just spent an awful lot of time not trying, get, being re very surly because I thought if I'm not, I've got to go to the lava. I'm, 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 I've got to either be vile tempered or, or I'm going to laugh. <laughs> what do you love most about teaching? I don't know. It's just seeing people master things, understand things. It's, it's, it's at the end when you can see that the, it, it ha they can see that it's all beginning to fall into place probably in some performance or other, and you could say, say, now do you see why? And they say yes, and you know that's part of them now. They don't have to think about it again anymore. Uh, I like students, I like students very much. I like their hopefulness, I don't disillusion them. Uh, and uh, no, I think the younger generation, they're, 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 they're great, I always enjoy it. And uh, they keep you alert. They certainly know if you're phony, but keep you alive. So, so I think you do have to love the generation you're teaching. Yes. Oh, yes. Yeah. yeah. And I know there's um, so many people that you've taught who uh, carry with them today the sheer veracity and the logic and the practicality and the passion and the purpose 
behind what we're doing this thing yes, for. Yes, yes, that's right. Yes, I, I, it'd be nice to think so. I think the saddest thing is that the uh, the world they find themselves in is very different to what... I mean, we all thought we were having a difficult time. I don't I suppose there's ever been a generation uh, that didn't think that. But um, it is much tougher for them today than it was for us, in a way. Mm. Uh, there was... As, as long as you... You know, you weren't just starstruck, but you were a stage struck, um, and you were prepared to do the work. Then it, it, it was very rewarding, and it was there to do. But I think it's very sad now well, the, the, the way the whole thing has been so commercialised that you know, if there's no money in it, then there's well, we all need money, and we, you know, and uh, there's no point in playing to empty houses. But um, I don't know. There's something kind of edgy about the, the thing now that I don't like. I'm glad that it's, it's, uh, I doubt if I'd made uh, I'd made the choices I made uh, when I was young. Uh, if I'd been young, say 20 years ago, I think I might have sort of had a feeling for it and and uh, and, and all that. But uh, I don't know where it came from with me. I, I simply don't know where it came from. Um, no, I don't. It's, uh, I determined to do it, but um, I was about nine, and I don't know. I don't think I've seen a play by then. I was always put in the school play, even in the. I can remember doing Alfred and the Cakes in the, about grade one, uh, and I thought, oh, that's pretty good. Uh, and uh, King Arthur pulling a ruler out of a book or a sword out of it. <laughs> so I was, I was always going to do it. But it was never... And of course I wanted an audience, but it was, it, I, I never had the bright lights feeling. Um, you know, that, that, that wasn't the dominating thing. I don't know where it came from. But I wanted to do it well. I wanted 